Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And again with me tonight, we have Brother Cripps and Sister Renee. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, hi to everybody in the chat room. And we, we are starting a little bit late, so rather than have all the pleasantries, I think we'll get right into the study. Our, um, it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 18. Uh, I'll let uh, Cripps and Renee make, give you a little greeting first, though. Our sister Renee, say hi to everybody. Hey, guys. Hey, good to see you. I'm glad I made it. Boy, there was a lot of obstacles today. Uh, but I got here. Um, I don't have the link to see you guys live in the chat, but I will in just a second. My channel's Renee Rowland. Uh, and I untwist scriptures that people like to twist up to make you think you must do something other than trust in what Christ has already done to get, uh, keep, or even prove salvation. So I'm glad to be with you guys finally. All right. Thank you, sister. And, and Brother Cripps? Yeah, sure. I'll make it really quick. Uh, Jason Cripps, the uh, channel's True Story Live, Sunday night at 9 p.m on this channel on Wednesdays and Talking Doctrine on Mondays. And hello to the chat. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I, I guess the only thing I should say is that um, uh, if you haven't seen this study from the beginning, I hope you will go back eventually and watch it from beginning of chapter one, verse one, and, and get up to date on it. <clears throat> but we, we're not going to go backwards, uh, so uh, you're not going to have a lot of context. Uh, but we're looking right now at chapter 6, verse 18, and let's look at it first in the uh, uh, KJV. Hey, Luke. Yes. Can you post the link to the live chat right here in this little thing in the messages so I can have it? Okay, i see if I can do that. Okay, Matthias is going to do it. So, uh, Matthias, are you going to be uh, putting the verses up for us? I don't see anything except a gray screen right now. There you go. Okay. So, beginning with uh, a cha a chapter, I mean, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that sinneth committed, he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Sister Renee. Yeah, I was closing my thing here. Yeah, this is pretty um, literal. Uh, he's telling them. He, he's rebuked them for some other things earlier, but he says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body. So all the other sins that we commit, they're out here. But he that committed fornication sins against his own body. But I also believe that means the body of Christ as well. Mm. Not just our physical body. Uh, mm. And he explains earlier, I think if we go up, yeah. Because he says, you know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body. And I believe some of this had to do with temple prostitution. A lot of these pagan temples had temple prostitution. And they would go in and join with these women. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, joined a harlot is one body. For two saints he shall be one flesh. So when you uh, sleep with someone outside of marriage, you are joining not only your body and sinning against your own body, but you're sinning against the body of Christ because Christ dw dwells within us. He's, he's showing them the magnitude of this sin. It's not something small. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll read it in verse 18 in the Amplified for Brother Cripps. Um, Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that uh, a man commits is outside the body, but the one, who is, is, the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Mm. 
Um, I like what Renee said. I mean, I, I'm going to have to think more about that, but I, I, uh, I don't think she's wrong. Um, certainly as marriage, we've talked about before marriage as being um, uh, an illustration or a shadow of the relationship that we have as the body of Christ uh, to Christ. Uh, you know, uh, that would make sense. So the, the, the body or the body of Christ and our own body when we sin uh, within morality. Um, we're sinning against ourselves, our own body, and against the body of Christ if we're claiming to be believers. That that actually makes sense. I mean, how hurtful is it when we hear someone in the body that's going outside of the prescribed method of, uh, of uh, sexual stuff, um, like in the context of marriage? Um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, I like that it, the Amplified adds a visual or written, and I would agree with that. I would agree that it's sexually immoral to look at porn and um, uh, any any kind of any kind of uh, visual or written. It's interesting that it says that. Um, you know, a lot of times we think of it as well. You know, looking at porn isn't that. It isn't adultery. Um, I feel like it is, and I and I say that to myself, uh, having uh, years ago um, struggled with that in one way or another. Uh, I don't struggle with it anymore. I've been set free of that and don't do it, but um, that's because of the grace of God and not because I'm a special person. Um, but I got to the point where I uh, looked at it that way as if it were adultery, um, and that was helpful for me to uh, stay away from it. Um, but either way, it is a sin against uh, the body, as Paul's saying, and it also keeps us separated from God, you know, at least speaking for myself, when I would uh, commit one of these things, then I'd, I was so filled with shame that I would not want to uh, bring it to him. And, and uh, you know, I felt like I couldn't talk to him. And uh, Renee's talked about that before, too, and that's the way I felt. Um, it's so much better when we don't do that and then we can, uh, well, we can always stay in relationship with, with, uh, with Christ. We can always stay in that. We don't have to do that. I'm just saying that, um, when we do that, it makes it diff more difficult for us. I think at least it did for me. Hmm. Well, you know, we, we've talked quite often about, uh, what is clear in the Bible, and and then some things are either it's not so clear, or it's really not. Um, there's not anything about it. Um, let me get some advice before I go into this. I'm a little bit worried if I get too explicit. Uh, you think that this is too early because maybe kids could be listening now? Yeah. Oh, it's almost yeah. ten o'clock. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think this needs to be addressed. All right. Um, I, uh, a lot, there are some things in the Bible that uh, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about, and I can see here in the uh, Amplified, it talks about, um, uh, let me see, where, where was it? Um, um, it says in any form, it says run away from sexual immorality. Now, first of all, in the KJV, it doesn't say anything about sexual immorality there. The term sexual morality is not in there. It says flee fornication. He's specifically talking about one thing, fornication. Uh, but uh, for some reason, the Amplified is taking the liberty to, I think this is ice and Jesus. I don't think this is the right way to treat the, this part of the scriptures. I like them amplifying a lot of times, but in this case, I think that they're inserting an, uh, something there that's not really part of it at all. Uh, I think this comment is, is limited to fornication, uh, but it says, uh, um, I keep losing my place. Um, it says, if, if, uh, run away from sexual immorality in any form, they say, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. That's adding so, to scripture for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously they're they're trying to make the, the point that even looking at pornography, 
even if you're thinking about it. Of course, we know Jesus said that it's not just what you do, it's even your thoughts that that are, you're, we're guilty of. Yeah. But in, in this case, it, it's I don't think it's right that they expound it and expand it in that way, uh, particularly talking about, uh, uh, you know, we know that pornography is a big problem. And then also, uh, I made a video several years ago about masturbation. And because people ask me, I, I did I did my own Q&A program where people ask me questions and I would make a video without a group discussion, just giving my own thoughts. So I have a video answering the question about masturbation. And I said, you know, that it's not directly spoken of. I can't find anything in the Bible that is clearly stating anything about it. But then we can have some verses that's talking about fornication or maybe even Maybe even in the KJV, there's going to be verses that talk about sexual immorality, but what what is what is included in that? Uh, if it doesn't exactly say it, I think we have to guard against um, uh, inserting our all our own ideas in there and uh, making the scripture say what we want it to say. Uh, I I looked at it in the NABRE also. If you can show that in the uh, amp, the verse 18 in the NABRE says also avoid immorality now where does it say it in the kjv anything about immorality it's talking about one particular type of sexual sin yeah because it's joining the bodies joining the bodies is the point here yeah it's not about immorality in a broad sense even though we know it's wrong but that's not what this verse is talking about it says every other sin is a person uh, a person commits is outside the body but the immoral person sins against their own body That's so not, I think that, that, they are, right. yeah both these translations are broadening the, this uh point that paul's making here making it much broader than paul had intended it to be um but i will say also that uh i said at the end of last wednesday's program that this portion of scripture had a tremendous impact on my life it it absolutely convicted me and it changed me from an adulterer and, and a fornicator and, and promiscuous uh, into someone who was no longer able to do it. Because the thought for me to, to engage in that, knowing that the Holy Spirit is living inside me and I'm dragging the Holy Spirit through my activity right along with me. It's like I'm forcing the Holy Spirit of God to participate in this act with me. And that, that whole thought was so powerful to me that it really, it changed my whole behavior around. Okay, uh, okay. Any any more from either of you before we go? Yeah, on? I, I want to say I think you're right on this one uh, because the point Paul is making is joining together with another body physically is sinning against your own body. So to add immorality in general through thinking or it 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 doesn't make the point that Paul is making, and I think this really has do with temple prostitution here uh that seems to be what was going on in the first century church mm -hmm. yeah okay all right let's go forward then uh back to the kjv verse 19 it says what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own all right, I'll stop there. I'm yeah. laughing because you I, said what? Like you were hard of hearing. <laughs> said, what? Well, well, you know, in Paul's style of writing that we, you know, we keep on talking about his style is so interesting. It is. Uh, he he asks a lot of questions. He he's like carrying on a conversation with himself, but I believe that's uh, his uh, prosopopoeia technique. You're right. You're right. Of presenting presenting. Uh, uh, and the, the argument, uh, both sides of an argument, saying, "Look, and it well, some will say this, but what? No, that's not." You're even, right. No. <laughs> so, so P P Paul is acting like shocked and outraged. Anybody could not understand this. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And then he says, "Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own." Don't you understand that? There's a question mark there. Now again, punctuation um, and uh, numbering of the verses, all this stuff is, is added later. It's not in the originals, or at least it's not in the Greek and Hebrew, the oldest copies we've got. So, uh, um, but I, I think it's clear from the, the wording that it should be a question mark. What? 
And then uh, well, I'm going to read verse 20 because it, it needs to go together, I guess. He says, um, ye, are not, uh, ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now there's a period. Brother Cripps? Yeah, I think this backs up what kind of what Renee's saying, actually. Um, know ye not that your body's temple, Holy, Holy Ghost. So we know that as believers, the the Ghost, the Holy Ghost, takes up residence in us, and He's uh, growing and changing us and quickening our dead spirit. So we're we're made alive uh, through Him. We're slaves to righteousness instead of to sin. Um, and then, uh, which you have of God, you are not your own, which we, we understand that concept. He paid the price for us. He's purchased us. He's redeemed us. Uh, 20, verse 20 follows up with that. For you you are bought with the price, that same price I just mentioned, which was Christ on the cross. He, he paid an awful price to redeem us, for sure. Um, glorify God in your body. So this is the part, you know, Renee's kind of saying, you know, you're sinning against the body of Christ. This would back that up. We have the Holy Spirit in us, so when we sin, we sin against ourselves because it, it, it's not good for us. Uh, but we're also, um, as Brother Luke has pointed out, you know, with the Holy Spirit in us, when we're uh, doing this, we're bringing the Holy Spirit along with us, and um, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and in your and in your spirit, which are God's, so He's paid for you. So you're sinning against yourself, you're sinning against the, the Holy Spirit, and you're sinning against the, the body in general. Um, I think it backs that up, that's all. Yeah, uh, well, it, Victoria uh, is actually is asking the question uh, about, does the Bible speak clearly on the subject of masturbation? And I, uh, as I said, I did make a video on it. It's not very long, probably 10 or 15 minutes long. So everybody, please go watch it if you're interested. But particularly the young men that were uh, asking me uh, about it, that, that are want to be, they're Christians. They, they have a horrible guilty conscience uh, because of it. And, and they're, they're asking me, what about what does the Bible say about it? And uh, I can't. I I looked at it, and I can't find anything that clearly tells me that uh, there's anything wrong with it or anything forbidden about it. We could probably uh, come to the conclusion uh, by uh, thinking about you know instructions of being moral and so. But but uh, it really doesn't say anything that, as far as I'm concerned to to tell us uh, absolutely. Um, the, the subject really isn't talked about at all. Um, uh, so do you have any uh, more information, either Renee or Chris? Yeah, the only that? thing I would say is that Jesus made it clear that our thoughts yeah. are considered a sin. And when you have to do that, you have to go somewhere sexually immoral in your mind. Yeah. That's the only. What are you, what are you looking at in order to facilitate that act? Right. If you're not visibly looking at something, you're mentally picturing yeah. it. And yeah. Well, I'm not sure without getting into all the, of our own life's experiences of how we've practiced that kind of activity, if you have done it. I don't know if everybody has, but I'm not so sure it's universally true that people look at a picture or even uh, imagine something in their mind necessarily. I think that it's probably the case much of the time, but not, I don't know if that's necessarily ab an absolute uh, thing but i see your point renee it certainly is uh i it's just I, I, it's I not feel, a salvation issue either and that's when most people get condemned they're scared they're not going to heaven because of it well that's, 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 sure that's got to be cleared up yeah, yeah. That, that, I, mean, I agree with that that's a different point but um i, I think it's ridiculous to <laughs> assume in some ways that someone yeah. should, at least for men i mean it may be different with a woman's body but for men there has to be some some kind of uh, stimulant, and if you're not thinking of something, you're not viewing something. I, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know how that's possible. I mean, I suppose it is, but um, uh, with the, I think it's clear. I mean, yes, Paul may not be talking about porn in this. I'm not. I'll I'll accept that point. Um, but as Renee pointed out, you know, Jesus made it clear about the thoughts that we have. 
are committing adultery in our heart. If we're if we're lusting after a woman, uh, we're we're committing adultery in our heart with her already. That that point is clear. So if you are uh, viewing this stuff and doing mm -hmm. that, um, I think it can you can make a strong point that you probably should stay away from that. I do agree with you, brother Luke. There's nothing particular about the act in and of itself, but there are uh, there are uh, conditions about our thought life, certainly. Yeah. And also, the, there's good news in the verses that you just read. There, mm -hmm. these are confirmations that these are already saved people. Yep. These people are already purchased. Yep. They're, they're not. Paul's not asking these people to abstain from fornication in order to get or stay saved. He's telling them, he's reminding them of who they belong to, that mm -hmm. we are not debtors to the flesh to feed the flesh. We oh. are debtors to Christ because he bought us. Yes. So this is a confirmation that these are saved people. Uh, he confirms it here because you're bought with a price. Yep. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's mm -hmm. all God's. You're not your own. You're God's. And I, I think if more people remembered that, you know, Luke uh, said it, it helped him to remember that Christ is right there with him. The Holy Spirit's right there with him, seeing and doing everything he's doing because he dwells within him. That helps some people. Some people need to remember who God says they are. You know, you're my child and, and children need to act like their father, you know, and this is confirming whose they are. And that's actually good news. I think, I think, uh, well, I want to respond to brother Dave, uh, that I don't think that verse brother Dave, uh, is, um, can be used in this context to answer this question because that particular verse pertains to, uh, a person that was told to, to, uh, um, to um, have the sexual relationships without, um, I think, for the purpose of reproducing, and, and he, he was not, uh, he did not want to have it have offspring, so he's purposely doing that. Oh and, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Really, yeah. You really cannot. You cannot. First of all, there's nothing about napkin in the verse, but uh, but just the idea of that taking that particular event and the people and that what was happening right then. I don't think it's right to apply that to this this particular question. He was about defrauding the woman. He was defrauding the woman, and that yeah. that was the sin there. It was yeah. his job to carry on his brother's name, and so when he when he spilled yeah. his seed outside yeah. of the woman, he was forcing yeah. her in, in into a bad situation. Yeah. That story with Judah when yeah. his when his daughter in law dresses as a prostitute in order to get pregnant because he stopped giving his sons to her he wouldn't he thought she was cursed and the sons were dying so he wouldn't do that for her so this is about honoring tradition you got to remember all of the um kinsman redeemer stories they all point to jesus so when you do something outside of the kinsman redeemer role you're mm -hmm. defiling mm -hmm. the picture of jesus christ as kinsman redeemer. Mm -hmm. i think that's more of yeah. what's going on there yeah um you know, there. I, I know. I got brother Dave was joking, uh, so we recognize that. But it's uh, one of the biggest mistakes we make in, in studying scriptures is uh, jumping to conclusions on a verse when not not looking at what was the intention of the writer at the time. What was the writer trying to convey to the people he was talking to right then? And and when we take it out of context to try to support anything else that we're we're any position we have is uh, that's what the saying says a text out of context is a pretext um, but that's why i was pointing out that i think that the amplified and the nabr in this case were broadening this and it was a form of eisegesis uh, you're in inserting other other things into this uh, point that paul's making that we're, he, paul, it's not part of what paul was talking about um all right and uh, <clears throat> And that's why I'm, I'm careful to not make a statement about masturbation because there's nothing that specifically tells me it's nothing. I mean, there's vague things that we can kind of piece together to form to form a conclusion on it. But uh, unless there's something absolutely clear, it's hard for me to be 
uh, uh, state something like this. This is the way it is. Sure. Um, all right. Let's go to another. Uh, oh, let's talk more about the rest of that verse, which is really the best part of it, I think. Uh, and that is, um, ye are not your own, mm -hmm. and you are bought with a price. Thank and, God. And, and the price, of course, uh, was the the shed blood and death of Jesus Christ. It, it, another scripture says that uh, it, it, we were bought with His God's own blood, and that's a that's a proof text for the deity of Christ because it says God's blood. I mean, if someone can find the exact verse, it would be helpful. But uh, uh, yeah, that, so uh, <clears throat> in a way, uh, we're not our own. Yeah, uh, we, we. The question is, be, Adam and Eve wanted to be their own. They that's that that was exactly what was going on. Yes. They were tempted by Satan uh, to become independent. Say, hey, you don't really need God. You can really be your own God if you understand right and wrong by eating from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God, knowing right and wrong. Therefore, you can be an independent and, and, and uh, make your own decisions. And uh, uh, I got the verse. Yeah, what is it? It is, hold on. It is Acts twenty twenty eight. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's saying God purchased us with his own blood and whose blood was it? Jesus. So yeah, obviously right. Jesus, Jesus is God. Yeah. Um, one of, you know, a hundred points we could make proving the deity of Christ. Um, but uh, yeah, the problem in the beginning was, was uh, uh, independence. Yep. Can we accept the relationship that God made us for, and that is to be dependent on God to provide everything for us. Yep. Uh, or, or are we going to say, I'd rather be independent. I'll provide for myself. That was a problem with uh, Cain. Uh, he wanted to, he, he went off and started doing everything for himself after he was cast out. That what did he do? He, he made uh, like cities and weapons and I don't remember everything he did, but he accomplished all kinds of things, but everything was based upon becoming self-reliant instead of re relying on God. Now we say that salvation is uh, coming to the realization that we are relying completely on Christ for our salvation, uh, reliance on Christ. But we not only rely on him to get saved, but now we want to rely on him as Brother Cripps learned for everything. We rely on him and trust him for all our needs in life. Yes. And, and that, that is a become saying, I am depending on God for everything. We all certainly should not be able to argue that we don't need God because he provides the air we, we breathe. Yep. And he, he provides the food that we would have no air or food. We could not exist without God providing at least that for us. Mm -hmm. And what he desired with us in the beginning, what he wants us to come back to is this, is this relationship of dependency on him. Yes. You cannot make that point strong enough, brother Luke. You can't make it strong enough. I've tried it the other way. Trust me. I've tried, I've tried living a life in my own power. It does not work. It's, it's, especially as someone that's been purchased. It, that's hilarious. He purchased me, and I'm like, I'm going to live by myself. I'm going to live on my own power. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So is trying to clean up your life. Yeah. You know, people think you begin in grace and then finish by your own efforts and willpower. Yep. Having begun in the spirit, you're now made perfect by the flesh. Everything <laughs> by his grace. In God's process, mm -hmm. let him work it out. Let him lead daily through the spirit that's in you. Yeah. The whole problem with the Lordship thing, you're trying to do something by your own. Let, let, let's look at 19 and 20 in the Amplified. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God mm -hmm. and that you are not your own property? You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. Amen. I think that was well said that time. I agree. Yeah. There's a footnote in the NABRE on this. Let's see what that says. 
uh, verse 19 and 20, it says, Paul's vision becomes Trinitarian, a temple that is sacred by reason of God's gift, his dwelling spirit, uh, not your own, but for the Lord who acquires ownership by the act of redemption. Uh, I didn't really follow that, they, uh, proving that it's some point, making a point about the Trinity. Let me read it again, see if you guys make sense of this. Paul's vision becomes Trinitarian. It, it says, a temple, colon, that is sacred by reason of God's gift, his dwelling spirit, mm -hmm. and not your own, but for the Lord. Okay, I can see it now. So the, the, it's the property of the Lord, uh, the spirit of God and and, uh, and and your uh your body is the temple so yeah I, I can see now it's, it's three three things there that uh, and then he goes on to say glorify God in your body the argument concludes with a positive imperative to supplement the negative uh, quote avoid immorality unquote uh, far from being a terrain that is morally indifferent the area of sexuality is one in which our relationship with God and his Christ and his spirit is very intimately expressed. He is either highly glorified or deeply offended. Hmm. Hmm. All right. I guess I don't have anything to say about that. No. All right. I'll let, let's move on now to the... Uh, uh, the next uh, chapter. I am so glad that he purchased me. Uh, I otherwise I would be uh, headed for hell, outer darkness. Amen. Whichever way you want to look at it, but instead, because he was willing to uh, purchase me, then I can look forward to reconciliation with uh, God. Too bad. Most proclaiming Christ don't believe that. It's only by his grace that I do. Amen. Okay. All right. So we're going on to chapter seven now, verse one in the KJV. Amen. Awesome. Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sister Renee. Yeah, I think if we go further, we'll find out this is in reference to people asking him whether it's good to marry or not. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, this is, uh, again, we need to realize all the time that this whole book here is Paul's answer to at least one letter or more yep. from, was it uh, was it Phoebe? Or it was Phoebe, I think, that uh, wrote him this these thing. And uh she, yeah, wasn't she the one that had uh, her in her the own? House of Chloe had some issues that had written to him. Oh, was it, uh, the House of Chloe, yeah. yeah, or Chloe's Chloe's people or yeah. Chloe's followers. It's just like some follow Paul, Paul, some follow um, Cephas, some follow uh, Apollos, and then we don't let's let's not ignore the fact that Chloe had a church and she had a following in her church at her home. So, but uh, it seems that Chloe wrote this letter maybe there are more letters there was probably another answer that paul wrote that we don't have uh, because he refers to another letter he wrote but, but nobody can has been able to find it so with that context he says now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me uh and we talked about in the beginning of uh, the the first corinthians the introduction that uh, they brought uh, wrote a letter expressing that there's basically five issues that uh, are problems that Paul needs to address as the uh, founder and uh, um, I don't know if you call him pastor he's not actively there but uh, the the founder of the church so um, all right uh, it says in the NABR I mean in the amplified uh, in first one now as to the matters of which you wrote it is good, that is, it's beneficial or advantageous for a man not to touch a woman outside of marriage. Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah, uh, beneficial and advantageous. Um, so I, I don't think he's saying that we can't 
uh, give them a brotherly, sisterly hug. I think that's all right. Um, I think the word touching would be uh, any inappropriate touching. And I don't want to misinterpret it, um, but he's uh, saying not to be tempted, to not put yourself in a tempting situation. And then this mentions sexual immorality. And then, then the point's made, let each man have his own wife and let each uh, woman have her own husband, et cetera. So uh, certainly in a marriage situation, and I think people should be even more careful. Um, you know, I, I know that there, uh, gosh, I used to tell Billy Graham stories and now he's kind of demonized. Um, but I heard a story about him and he wouldn't ride in an elevator with, a, with a woman, uh, just he and another woman. Um, he wouldn't, uh, uh ride in cars with, uh, probably for accusation purposes. So exactly. They exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think you can be too careful. Uh, with that, um, avoiding temptation in, in general and avoiding the way it looks. But um, I, I think that in today's society, in 2019, uh, uh, people do all kinds of things that they shouldn't uh, put themselves into scenarios all the time. And I think with affairs being so high in America, it can be avoided. I have rules about, uh, and this isn't, again, before I even say this, this isn't a, that, that I'm some holy person. It's not that at all. Um, but I'm in a relationship and I, I don't want to risk any, even uh, the chance of it looking like uh, I'm doing something inappropriate. So we have rules about me not talking in uh, private chat with, with a woman uh, without uh, Jen being present. Um, and that just protects us both. And she has the same rules. She's not going to talk to guys in private chat. Um, that's not what he's talking about. I'm just saying, uh, in general, we can be more careful. And I think that's what Paul's warning about here. Uh, not to touch a woman outside of marriage, uh, inappropriate touching. Uh, hmm. I, uh, here's the thing though. You got, uh, these, um, these chapter divisions, as, as we keep on saying, uh, is that, that these were added by, uh, translators and publishers and, and it became record. Uh, I'm, I'm not translators and publishers, but the, um, I, I don't really know who was the first to divide it into chapters and, and verses. Um, that would be a very interesting thing to, to look at. Of all the things I've studied about Bible history and church history, I don't think I've ever learned anything about who was the first to divide it into chapters and, and verses. But uh, uh, we have to be careful, and, and even also punctuation. Uh, we have to be careful to draw too much from the punctuation, the capitalization, the uh, chapter and verse divisions. Some people really try to read a lot into that and come to some conclusions that I think are, are uh, it's very risky. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is that uh, if, if we continue this verse with the last few verses in mind, uh, maybe Paul is not talking about just actually touching somebody like shaking their hand or give them a hug or something or anything like that. It, it, he's, he's still referring to touching them in a, in a, as in terms of having sexual relations. Uh, that's how I would look at this. Would that make, if with that context, you guys, wouldn't that make a great closing line to his last thought? And then he's moving on to the next. Yeah. Well, check that out. If you added that to what he just finished saying, hey, don't join together with a harlot. Yeah. And then he says, you are not your own. And then he confirms, so I'm writing to you to answer your question, that it's good. It's good not to touch a woman. I think that's a good way to close that whole subject out, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Possibly. In a, in a sexual manner. That's what I was saying. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think it would be a good way to close that out and start anew in in uh Chapter seven, verse two, would be like a new thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, in the Amplified, it says, "Now, as to the matters of which you wrote, it is good. That is, it's beneficial or advantageous for a man not to touch a woman outside of marriage." Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but there is a, a footnote here in the Amplified that I find interesting. It says. Uh, some scholars believe Paul may have been a widower. 
Now, that's the very first I've ever heard that. Me too. Uh, now, some I've heard other people tell me that they thought Paul was married, but I, there's no way I can believe that. There's nothing ever anywhere saying that he was married. Uh, and it goes on to say in this chapter here, I think it's about uh, why he's not married, but uh, could he have been a widower? I don't know, uh, unless there's something in a, in a historical record that, that we could draw upon. There's nothing in the scriptures that, that we could make that conclusion. I don't. Uh, it's unusual for a rabbi, like someone is scholarly, to not get married uh, in their early 20s. That's an argument they said. That's an argument they use about Jesus being with right. Mary Magdalene. But it's not unheard of. But it's clear to me that Paul was not married at the time of his writings and went on to say why he wasn't married. So it doesn't really matter whether he was a widow or not. It, it, I mean, he, it has nothing to do with his ability to be an apostle or, or his uh, um, um, encouragement to the Christians. Yeah. Whether he well, in, in, in some ways, though, uh, now, I, I, I think that a lot of Paul admits that some of the things he writes are his own thoughts. And then some of the things he's telling us, God's given him this message to, to give us. Uh, so um, is, I think some of this chapter here may be Paul's thoughts. And, uh, but he doesn't have experience as a married person that I'm aware of. And it is kind of hard for someone who hasn't been married to start advising everybody else about marriage, I would say, without that kind of experience. Uh, I'm not objecting to his, his uh, points he's making or his conclusions anyway. I absolutely agree with that. But uh, it is interesting to me that uh, he can come to these conclusions, but he doesn't have any real life experiences dealing with it. Uh, but, so let's let's move on to. I was just gonna say real quick, brother Luke. If if he was married, I could just see him coming home and, and her hearing some of the things that he said that people kind of take out of context, and and he would get an earful from her. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it just made me laugh. I was thinking about. It. Oh man! I said before uh, when we were talking about Paul's. Uh, um opinion on or stating about um, I am your father in a spiritual sense and that uh, someone told me that uh, he blames Paul as uh, the, the founder of some of the Roman Catholic doctrines because they they take Paul's point about I'm your spiritual father and say that the, the priest is your spiritual father and then they take Paul's writings here about uh, not getting married and apply that to the priests well, they just pick and choose what they want because they throw out the warning that it's a doctrine of devils to not to forbid somebody to marry. And then they throw out where Jesus said, don't call any man father. Yeah, but, uh, but Paul is not saying you should not get married as we go forward. He's not saying don't get married. He's saying he's telling you you should get married if you can't handle the, the sexual uh, uh, drive you have. OK, let's go to. Uh, Verse 2 in the KJV, it says, uh, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. And in verse 3, I'll read also, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Uh, I think I ought to read more to keep the, the, all this is all part of the same point he's making. So verse four, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. De verse five, defraud ye not one another, one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer I keep on getting pop-ups blocking my view. Uh, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Incontinency. That's an interesting word. Okay, Brother Cripps, uh, verses 2 through uh, 6, through 5. Yeah, this is all good stuff. I mean, Paul's saying in verse 2, um, 
you know, let's, in order to avoid fornication, let's every, every man, every woman, you know, keep to themselves, um, stay with your husband, stay with your wife. And um, let's also uh, give with uh, benevolence to each other. Uh, I feel like he's talking about uh, sexual things to each other in in the context of being married. Um, and uh, obviously he's already made it clear not to go outside of that. It's within the, the, the marriage bed is undefiled. He's already said that. Um, and then uh, verse four, this is beautiful. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife, they, they belong to each other. They're one flesh. Um, and before we do verse five, I would say that that also mirrors that we're the Lord's. You know, if, if we look at this as uh, chapter six being a lead in into chapter seven, like Renee's suggesting, and I would agree, um, it's all one, it's all one thing, all one thought. He's saying that that we're the Lord's, he's bought us, he paid for us. And I believe that when we're one flesh, we we uh, are each other's, the husband and the wife, um, they're, we're, they're not owned by anyone else. And verse four uh, uh, kind of points that out. The wife hath not power of her own body. Um, you give up the rights to your own body and you belong to your husband and the wife gives up her own rights to her own body. Now, that goes against what we hear in the world for sure. You know, the woman has her rights and that's it. The man has no say over it. So this goes against what the world says. But, you know, Paul's making a, a really good point here, at least when it comes to a godly marriage, that you don't own your own body anymore. Your, your husband owns it. And in the same way, God owns us. We don't own our own bodies. He owns it. He purchased us. I, I think there's parallels here being made. And then verse five, defraud ye not one another, except the, so this, we've we've heard this before. And this is don't withhold your uh, sexual things from your husband or your wife, unless you both agree to do so for, for a period of time. Uh, and he points out fasting and prayer and then come together again. And this is uh, that, that Satan not tempt you uh, in, Continency, incontinent. I, I don't use that word a lot. It means uh, something else to me. Um, but uh, based on the verses that he's already said, um, to avoid temptation, to to uh, to be consistent within in the marriage, and not go outside of it. That's what it means to me. Hey, how many times have you heard people they get divorced because the the wife refuses to have sex with her husband? Okay. And he gets so insecure and she's constantly, I don't feel good. I feel yeah. sad or I'm this or I'm, it's all about how she's feeling. Yeah. And then he gets insecure and then some other woman at work gives him the attention and the affection and he goes out in an extramarital affair. Mm -hmm. This is the exact um, thing that scripture is talking about. Now that's happened for women too, where the husband doesn't want anything to do with him or maybe she's gained some weight or yeah. whatever. And they're both were acting like their body's their own and, and it's, it's, you know, it's mine, it's my decision. And, yep. and, and there's no way to do that without putting the partner, if they're sexually frustrated in a very bad situation, yes. they're forced to go outside the marriage. You're forcing them towards sin. Yeah. What you're doing and it. It's true. And I know that the world would disagree with that, but when you get married, it's not about you anymore. I told you I saw this um, cartoon and it had a husband and a wife and both of them were starving. To, to, they were both starving to death, but they had a huge meal in front of them. But their spoons were too long and they're trying to feed themselves. And it's too long. It, it, they can't get it in their mouth. Their arms aren't long enough. If they would just feed each other, they'd both cool. be full. That's beautiful. They need to think about what each other needs. Now, if he's thinking yes. about what you need and you're thinking about what he needs, they're both being fulfilled. Never have a problem, Renee. But if they would just think of the other person. So this here, when it says, uh, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, and as Brother Luke said, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So if it's good if, to not touch a woman, it's good to not be married. If you can physically handle the sexual frustration. Yep. If you can't, 
it's good to get married. Yep. God made husband and wives for to be one flesh, to have children, all of that, all a blessing. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. So he should be, now in this context, it's clearly physical. He should be yeah. giving her physical affection. Yep. And likewise, the wife unto the husband. This is a nice way of saying sexual affection. And uh, the wife has not, because that, that's when it says the wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, the husband has not power of his own body. It's not just the wife that doesn't have power of her own body. Right. The husband Amen. doesn't have it either. Amen. Amen. And, and brother, as Brother Jason said, defraud, defraud not one another. So you are defrauding. When you went into that marriage covenant, you said, my body's not my own. We are one flesh. We are one. Yep. When you take it away and say, it's now mine, you can't have it. You have defrauded your husband or wife. Yep. So you yep. made a covenant that you did not mean and you're not sticking to it. Yep. So, and it says right here that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Yep. So uh, that's how he tempts these people into extramarital affairs. Yep. He'll play in their head. Your wife hates you. She hasn't had sex with you in three months. You're no longer attractive. You're, you know, she doesn't love you. And then he'll go outside the marriage to get his needs met. Yeah. And people need to take responsibility for doing that to their spouses. They really do. And that's what Paul's trying to avoid here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on a limb here just really quick. The, Renee, loved what you just said. Loved it. Agreed with every word. Um, I'm going to go on a limb here and say, when you look at all the verses in scripture, that talk about what marriage is supposed to be, I firmly believe that if a man and a woman would follow those to the letter, follow it, and including these verses here, divorce would be non-existent for, for believers. And that is going on on a limb, but I believe it. And, and I will not be in another marriage when I don't follow his word um, to the letter in this way. She said that word uh, in, incontinency, I didn't check it out. It's lack of self-control. Yep. That makes sense. Makes perfect sense with the context here. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paula. It's great. Well, uh, I I sometimes think I share too much, uh, <laughs> but I um, obviously this when it's talking about. The wife hath not power of her own body. It's not talking about you. You have the right to make your wife do the dishes and do this and do that. It, this is specifically talking about our bodies and our sexual relationship in the marriage. Uh, that in that context. Yeah. So let's not pussyfoot around the question. This is about the the need for each other to satisfy each other's needs. Yep. And I. Uh, my wife's been out of town for four weeks. She's coming back tonight, right after this Bible study. I'm going to pick her up from the airport. And uh, uh, we've got our 40th uh, anniversary coming up uh, on the 26th in five days. Awesome. But um, this portion of scriptures, I lived it, uh, but in, in the wrong way. In that right. my wife and I did not have this kind of relationship. And be, be, because of that, uh, I got so angry and resentful uh, with my wife that I ended up just saying, okay, uh, if I don't have a relationship with her, I'll get it somewhere else. So, or I routinely over the period of years had girlfriends and, and, and was able to satisfy that need. And my wife was even aware of it, but she put up with it because she didn't want to, to have anything to do with me. So it was a bad marriage for a while. We ended up getting divorced. And then because my son was a young, very young boy and my, my uh, need to be with him, uh, I really was able to make a reconciliation with her. Even though I knew we had the, our issues, we, I think we both understood that this, my son needed both parents. So we got back together and we got remarried. And uh, so it'll be 40 years from our uh, original marriage, uh, but there was about a year and a half where we were not married. And uh, 
So this, I, I've lived this. I know what happens when you, um, when this does not play out the way it should, according to the scriptures here, and what it, what it leads to. And I'm, I'm very thankful. And getting back to this question earlier about the the masturbation question, and I, when the young men have written me, all disturbed, uh, and uh, having this tremendous sex drive that uh, I don't know how it is for a woman. I have no idea if it compares to a man's, but I know that in my life when I was young, that it was so, such an overpowering thing that it basically consumed me. And uh, I was not a good match for my wife because of that. And uh, I'm thank you, Jesus, uh, that he's take, finally taken away. As I've gotten old, I no longer have that desire or need. And only because of that do we have a great marriage now because I'm not expecting that from my wife. And it's uh, 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 what we have is a great love, a uh, great friendship, uh, a great uh, uh, um, need and cooperation in our marriage. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we have a fantastic marriage, but it was really, really horrible in a lot of ways for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the root of the, root of the problem. So, uh, I, that's why I have a lot of uh, sympathy and empathy for the young men who want to be, they're Christians. I don't say they want to be Christians, but they, they're Christians and they're young men. They have this overpowering sex drive and then they don't, they don't have an outlet for it. What are they going to do? Well, Paul is telling us you need to get married so that that can be the, uh, uh, the place for, for that need to be satisfied. Yeah. Let me read these verses in the uh, Amplified here. Well, before you do, Brother Luke, thank you for your transparency. I appreciate that. And and Mike Elder said in the uh, chat that you sharing makes him feel comfortable to open up and share the things he's uncomfortable to express. So there is a purpose, Brother Luke, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but there is a purpose to putting yourself out there like that and, and being open and authentic in that way. It makes people feel more comfortable. So appreciate you doing that. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. All right. Uh <clears throat> I'll read these verses in the Amplified, see how they express it. It says, uh, uh, starting with verse three, the husband must fulfill his marital duty to his wife with goodwill and kindness, and likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have exclusive authority over her own body, but the husband shares with her. And likewise, the husband does not have exclusive authority over his body, but the wife shares with him. Mm. Do, do not deprive each other of marital rights, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves unhindered to prayer, but come together again so that Satan will not tempt you to sin because of your lack of self-control. Uh, I should add, uh, in case people haven't heard me talk about this before, uh, uh, I had that period, long period of uh, adultery, but uh, after I got saved, um, as I said, that um, uh, I was so convicted that I, I could not engage in it any longer, but it didn't, it didn't take away my frustration and resentment because even then, uh, now, uh, at that point in my life, I was, uh, Okay, um, I'm not going to be a fornicator or adulterer any longer, but I but I'm left with being frustrated and angry and resentful. Uh, and as I said, the only thing that's finally t took that away is getting old and, and not having that need. So, <clears throat> all right, uh, there's no footnotes on that. So let's go to back uh, to the KJV for. Uh, Uh, verse 6 in the KGV says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as, my, as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain... Let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. I'll stop at verse 9. Uh, Sister Renee? 
Yeah, I'm going to be clear here, here that when Paul says it's better to marry than to burn, he's not talking about burning in hell like some people say. He's talking about burning with lust in the flesh, burning with lust. Get him, Renee. Better to marry than to burn with lust. It's clear. Good gracious people. Get him. All right. So when it says. He says, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So he's saying, I'm not commanding these people to not get married, Catholic Church. <laughs> this is his opinion, how, how they would do better as servants of God to not have to worry about taking care of a family. This is why he's saying it. They're not distracted uh, from their purpose of serving through their gift. That's why he mentions the gift. For I would that all men even were as myself, but every man has the proper gift of God. One after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them if they abide, even as I. If they remain unmarried, if you've lost a wife or you've never been married, it's good for you to be like me and not be married. Because they can use their gift. That's why I mentions the gift. But if they cannot contain, talking about their sexual needs, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn. Again, this is burning with passion or lust or sexual need that's what that's talking about yep and he's not commanding that it's his opinion he said that okay very good let me read that in the amplified for you brother Cripps. uh all right um but i am saying this as a concession not as a command i wish that all the people were as i am but each person has his own gift from god one of this kind and one of that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that as a practical matter, it is good if they remain single and entirely devoted to the Lord as I am. But if they do not have sufficient control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is a pretty simple point. So he, he's he's simply saying, and Renee did a great job. It's not it's not what uh, other people it doesn't have anything to do with hell. It's the, it's the uh, idea of burning with passion to the point where you're going to go and do things that it, it, it it's clearly against what the, uh, against your own body and against the Holy Spirit that uh, has purchased you. You know, you, you're purchased by Him. So uh, we're not to burn in lust and follow our own passion. So um, in a marriage situation, you know, he's he set this up in the verses leading up to this. So he's just simply saying, um, I like that he says uh, about the gifts, you know, his own gift from God. Um, I've met people that are unmarried and they don't seem to have uh, a much of a sexual appetite and, and um, they're, they're fine doing that. Um, I do agree that the Catholic Church took these verses the wrong way, and um, they set the the priest in the Catholic Church up up to fail over and over and over again. That's clear to me. Um, but uh, for us, saying that you know, if if you uh, if you are single and you can remain single and stay devoted to God and be in ministry or whatever, and and you don't really struggle in this area, then it's better to stay single. But if you're going to burn with lust, then it's better that you get married so you're not putting yourself into that situation. It's very, very simple. Yeah, the uh, Paul's, I think Paul's conclusion is, and his advice is, uh, it would be great if you could be like me, Paul. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, I am a full-time uh, servant of Jesus. Uh, I have nothing hindering me. I don't have a wife or children that need my time and attention. So I'm free to give all my dedication and dedicate all my time and efforts to serving Jesus. And that is the ideal, but uh, I'm able to uh, deal with the s sexual drive. Apparently Paul either was able to master it or he didn't have a strong sexual drive that was frustrating him. But he says, not everybody's like me. So if you're not like me and you have an overpowering sexual drive, it's going to either lead to fornication and all the, all the uh, uh, consequences that come with that sin. Um, every sin brings its own consequences. 
Uh, he says, rather than doing that, then you need to at least uh, satisfy that sexual need you have within the bounds of a marriage. That's where it's supposed to take place. Amen. Okay. Now let's read the footnotes on the NABRE. There's a, a footnote here, verse uh, says one through 16. Uh, we, we haven't gone that far, but this is a, a, what it says. It's all connected. It says, it seems that some Christians in Corinth were advocating asceticism in sexual matters. The pattern, uh, it is a good thing, but occurs twice in 1 Corinthians, uh, suggesting that uh, in this matter, as in others, the Corinthians have seized upon a genuine value, but are exaggerating or distorting it in some way. Once again, Paul calls them to a more correct perspective and a better sense of their own limitations. The phrase, it is a good thing in 1 Corinthians 7.1, may have been the slogan of the ascetic party at, the, at Corinth. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that uh, the uh, footnotes and also Sister Paula, Bible literalist, pointed out last time that the uh, saying that I've always uh, loved uh, that Paul wrote, and it's, it is uh, um, uh, it, it, um, in all things, uh, let me see, uh, um, all things are lawful unto me, not all things are expedient or which means beneficial or uh, profitable. Uh, so uh, I, I always assumed that was Paul's thought or God's message. And uh, but Paula and the footnotes are saying that that was, uh, as Paul does, he's taking a position that others take and, 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 and uh, discussing it. So, uh, uh, that's what they're really saying about this also, is that he's saying that it is a good thing, this being ascetic, and, and I, ascetic is, I guess, uh, that would be someone that is uh, non-physical, is just abstaining from all the physical pleasures of life. If, I, if I'm uh, defining that correctly, let me know. But uh, this idea of being ascetic, as it says in verse 1, there, the footnote is saying that in verse one, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So uh, the footnotes are saying that that is the, the, the message that they were teaching at the church that Paul is responding to. So he's saying, yeah, it is good, but you know, well, let's look at all the whole perspective. Let's look at this and, and, and you know, examine all, all parts of that question. All right. Uh, any more on that before I go to another verse, Renee or Cripps? No, sir. I think that's good. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, verse 10 in the KJV says, uh, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, this is verse 11, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Renee or Cripps, your turn to go first, 10 and 11. Yeah, unto, uh, unto the married. So if you once you get married, um, you know, Paul's saying, uh, don't leave, you know, stay with your husband. You're equally yoked and you're in a marriage, you're one flesh, stay with him. Um, but if she does leave, then she should be unmarried. That's pretty, pretty simple. What he's saying there, um, or to be reconciled to the husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So he's saying the husband shouldn't put uh, divorce his wife. I mean, put away is the same as divorce. And Paula can correct me on that if if I'm wrong, but that, that, that's my understanding of it. Put away is the same as divorce. Um, that, that's that's the terminology they used back then. I think divorce is used a couple times too, but it's mostly put away. I believe. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, Renee, let me let me read 10 and 11 uh, in the Amplified. I, I really want to say real quick, I believe mm -hmm. this is talking about in reference to having a spouse that does not believe. 
Okay, uh, the Amplified disagrees. Let me read it and then you can respond. Okay. It says, but to the married believers, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife is not to separate from her husband, but even as she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not leave his wife. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clear here that, see, I, I still think this might be, why else would a husband want to put away his wife? I mean, unless she just wasn't a believer. All right, so if this is the case where both people believe, uh, I think he's saying that if a husband, let me, let me go here. Uh, if unto the married I command, the Lord commands it, uh, let not the wife depart. So her, a wife should not leave her husband. But if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So if she does leave her husband, she shouldn't be with another man. She should stay by herself or return to him, but not go forward to try to marry someone else. And then it says, and let not the husband put away his wife. So uh, there was a question given to Jesus. Can we just put away our wives, you know, because we want to? pretty much it was just kind of like for whatever we feel like and he's like no don't you know from the beginning it was one man and one woman <coughs> so <coughs> i think he's addressing the same thing here. there's no reason you should be putting away uh your wife and if the wife does leave for whatever reason uh she shouldn't be going to find another man she's just gonna have to stay by herself uh to to stay single i guess stay unmarried but she's already married. So, I, I mean, I don't get that. That's why it says, um, unto the married I command. And if she departs, let her remain unmarried. How can she be remain unmarried if she departed from her husband whom she was married to? I guess that they're saying if she got divorced, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Because I don't know how she can remain unmarried unless he's saying unmarried to someone new. Let her remain unmarried to someone new. Uh, I think this is just about uh, getting divorced or putting away. That's why I thought it had to do with one believing and one not believing. And that's why he goes into deeper detail later. But it could be just in general. Yeah, I, I think there is a another scripture that talks about that point you made there. Um, but uh, let's let me try to let us all try to answer brother Dave he asks us um, why do people teach that divorce and remarriage is perpetual sin of adultery and not a one-time act of sin Renee or Cripps either one oh because Jesus said that if you put away your own wife for anything more than adultery you can when she marries somebody else, she's now in adultery because you have forced her. It was more of a warning to the husband that her sin would be on their head for putting her away for no reason whatsoever. Thank you. That was more of the point of the story of Jesus, not to condemn people that got divorced and remarried that they're in perpetual sin. I might have to actually do another video on that. But the whole point of that is the men wanted to throw away their wives because, you know, they didn't like the shirt she was wearing or whatever. And and he's like, no, no, if you put her away from anything other than adultery and she goes out and remarries, her sins on your head, you're forcing her into adultery. So that was the whole point of him telling them that. That's what people twist up. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. Uh Well, whether whether is this is a sin that continues day by day, every day that you continue living in this state, that a new another sin is adding up and adding up, or whether because you did it initially, in it, it, it all counts as one sin. Does it really matter? Uh, I I keep on thinking about how um, Jesus has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Yeah, our sins and iniquities he remembers no more now i'm not saying that that gives us freedom just 
well, go ahead and sin all you want. You don't need to be concerned about these things. We know that there, uh, there are consequences that come with sin. We also know that there is some kind of con uh, chastisement for the b believers. Uh, but um, so I would say that if this is a problem, then there will be some kind of consequences that comes out of it. And, and, and that perhaps the Lord will do something to uh, try to straighten it out through some kind of chastisement. As I keep saying, chastisement is not the shepherd taking his staff and beating the sheep. There's it's not a, breaking their legs, right, Brother Luke? No, what he does yeah. with the staff is he steers them. He's yeah. directing them yeah. to go a different way. That's all. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, does, it doesn't really matter uh, um, what our sins are paid for. Uh, so uh, oh, it's not you don't have any, God doesn't have an issue with you. God knew all this, whether you were going to be living in this state for a day or a week or ten yes. years. God knew it before you did it, and it's paid for. Yes. So why does it matter? Uh, except that you know there may, there may be when we do anything uh, contrary to the what God's plan is, then then it's uh, uh, it's it's going to probably bring up some problems in our life as, as a result yes. of it. Yeah, okay. and until you've until you've gone through it, you don't know the venom that comes from these uh, self righteous people that because they're they're still uh, uh, they stayed married uh, and they they want to point the finger at people. Gosh, I've heard so many stories because this happened to me. I went through a divorce and my ex did commit adultery, so I'm good there. If anyone wants to throw stones at me, um, I'm I'm good, uh, but. The venom that comes from people anyway, and and accusing those people that go through divorce, uh, you know, as if they've committed some sin that's higher than any other sin in the Bible, and it's just ridiculous. You know, I, I love what you said there, Brother Luke, I, and I personally appreciate it. Um, you know, he paid for this as well on the cross. He paid for the sin of you know, even if there was an adultery, if you're being abused by someone and you just can't stay with them anymore and you leave, um, that sin, that adultery that you're committing supposedly is still also covered uh, on the cross, that Jesus has has uh, covered that. So I appreciate that, what you said. You're muted. Yeah, I muted because I thought maybe my fan, can you hear my fan? Does anybody have an issue if I have this fan on high right now? No, sir. You hear it? Okay. You're good. All right. Uh, then um, let's go back to the KJV and look at verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, here's the part about believe a husband that doesn't believe her name, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife uh, is uh, sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Wow. Okay, Renee, you get to figure that one out. <laughs> I'll take the amplified when it comes to me. All right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Untwist that one, sister. How far did you go? 12, 13, and 14. 14 is all. There's 12, enough here. 12, 13, and 14. Okay, hold on. No, we did 12 and 13. Didn't I give you a turn on 12 and 13? Uh-uh. I'm sorry. Crips. Oh, you just did it. You just did it just now. Yeah, you just did it now. 12, 13, and 14. I know. I, I, I thought you already talked about 12 and 13. Uh-uh. No, so 10 and 11. So how far should I go? 12, 13, and 14. We just did That's verse 14. Okay. So 12, right. 13, and 14. Me, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believeth not, so if, if if a believer has a wife that does not believe and she's happy to stay with him, even though he's converted to faith in Christ, uh, don't put her away. Don't divorce her if she's happy to go ahead and stay with him, even though she doesn't believe it. And the woman which has a husband that doesn't believe, if he's happy to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So uh, it does as long as the spouse is happy to stay with the believer, there's no reason for them to split up. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Elsewhere, your children unclean, but now they're holy. So it means that the blessing of God 
the household itself is holy and set apart because one of those in the marriage is believing. Why is that? Because two have become one flesh. So if the wife believes, the husband is made holy. If the husband believes, the wife is made holy. Also, the children are sanctified. The whole household is made holy because of the believer that is within the household. How can God pour a blessing upon a household by if only the person that believes is under that blessing? Because for the husband to not be under the blessing and the children to not be under the blessing would mean the wife wouldn't be happy. The wife can't be blessed if her husband is 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 not doing well and her children aren't doing well. The whole household is sanctified. It is holy to God because of the believer within the marriage. And again, they're one flesh. He's not going to divide them that's one flesh and make them two again. So to him, they're one and it, they're sanctified because of one of them that works. Let me ask you, because I, I can't believe that you're, you're I hope I'm not under, hearing this the way I thought. I, you're not saying that the uh, whole family is saved because no, one person no. is saved. No, 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 no. The, the whole family is not saved. They're set apart and holy and blessed. That's temporal. That's here on earth. That means that the if the wife believes and the husband doesn't, no curse is going to come upon him because he doesn't believe in Jesus because that would hurt the wife. That would hurt her household. So the whole household is set apart holy and blessed because of the one believer that's in the household. So uh, there's no way that, that, that God can pour wrath on one without affecting the believer. So okay. this, is, this is temporal and earthly. This doesn't mean that the children, the the unbelieving spouse is saved by the wife's belief. Right. Yeah. They have to believe. Each person has to believe on their own to be saved. But what it does mean is that there is a, a temporal earthly covering, a blessing and a Covered. holiness upon that house yes. because of the believer that's within it. Because to, to, to put wrath on anyone in that household would hurt the believer who's sacred to God. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I asked you to clarify that because I'm afraid some people might have got the wrong impression from your Thank first, you. first statement. You. Uh, Cripps, I'm going to read it in the Amplified, and then I'm also going to read the short footnote uh, in the Amplified for you. It says in, uh, in verse 12, 13 and 14, to the rest, uh, I declare, I, not the Lord, since Jesus did not discuss this, uh, that is any believing brother has a wife who does not believe in Christ and she consents to live with him, he must not leave her. And if any believing woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified. That is, he receives the blessings granted through his Christian wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be ceremonially unclean, but as it as it is, they are holy. Uh, now, let me look at the footnote. I think that was helpful, but also in the footnote, it says, uh, uh, verse 12, Christians married, uh, no, no, uh, verse four, 14, the footnote is, the unbeliever is not saved by marriage to a Christian. Each person, whether spouse or child, must make a personal decision. Brother, Brother uh, Matthias uh, wants to respond to that. Must make a personal decision to accept and follow <laughs> Christ <laughs> to receive salvation and God's promises. All right, so we have a, I'm sure I'll have an issue with how that was stated. But the first part where it says the unbeliever is not saved by marriage to a Christian, uh, each person must, uh, and, and spouse and children must, we would say, believe on their own, uh, not as personal decision to accept and follow. Okay, all well, right. I, I, yeah, I'll answer the footnote first for, for hmm. Matthias, and he can, he can correct me, but he would say that, there's no problem with the first part of it. it. It is a personal decision to 
uh, follow Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. We just covered this uh, uh, Monday night. We covered this Monday night with Paula. But the receiving of salvation, that's not a decision. Uh, but he can comment. That'll be interesting. Um, but as far as the scripture uh, that you just went over, I'm glad you clarified it. But I think that um, I think that what Renee said uh, covered it pretty well. Um, and I have a lot of lot of questions about this, um, but I, it, it can be clarified by a comment made in the chat by Victoria Sarton. She says, "If you can live in peace, stay together." And I think that I, I think that is a, a, a good uh, a good sentence that talks about what's being said here. Um, you know, they're saying that if each person consents, whether it's the the man that's a believer and the woman that's not, or the woman that's a believer and the man that's not, um, you know, if each, if each of you consent to live together, then you should stay together. Bottom line, that's what it's saying to me, um, because. Then if you read all these and then you get into the idea of, well, what if what if one of them has demons? What if one of them is physically and emotionally abusive? That's that that's not at peace. That's not one consenting. No one is suggesting, though, people out there, so-called Christians will say, oh, you're supposed to. Yeah, if your husband's beating you, then you should you should stay. Paul says you should you should just stay that you, you, you can't leave. And then if you if you do leave then uh, you should stay separated and, and, and not, uh, not ever marry someone else that might love you and, and treat you with uh, godly respect and kindness. And I, I, have, I have a hard time with that, but just me speaking personally. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, how about if we do verse 15 and 16, that might be a, a place to, to stop uh, since it's uh, after 11 in your, your time. Perfect. Uh, Okay, 15 and 16 in the KJV. Uh, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Ooh. But God has called us to peace. Mm. Verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man? whether thou shalt save thy wife. Wow. Wow. Yeah, go ahead, Wow. There's the answer right there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I've heard more than one person that's struggling in this place. They're being abused by their husband. And I know that men get abused too. So, you know, just let me finish. Um, but I've heard uh, people struggling with this because they're hearing from the church Oh, well, you need to stay. You need to love him to the Lord. You need to stay with him. You, you know, um, God could use uh, you as a believing spouse uh, to to turn him uh, to, to Christ, to save him. And uh, Paul saying here, these two verses, that's that I, I have looked over these, but they've never made more sense to me than they do right now. Um, God has called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Um, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, the ties well, all up quite nicely. Well, Brother Cripps, I I, I know you've told me before that uh, these Bible studies are helping you to understand better than mm -hmm. you had. Yep. And uh, isn't it a wonderful thing that we can uh, study and try to figure out these scriptures together? Yeah. and uh, help each other come to better understanding. It's extremely uh, edifying, Ex and I use that word extremely strongly. All right, Renee, I'm going to read the 15 and 16 in the Amplified, and then you can comment. Go ahead. Uh, but if the unbelieving partner leaves, let him leave. In s such cases, the remaining brother or sister is not spiritually or morally bound, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband by leading him to Christ? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife by leading her to Christ? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm glad they clarified what it meant how to, to save your husband. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad they clarified it. But <clears throat> it says, uh, um, 
if the unbelieving depart let only so if you're if your spouse doesn't believe and decides hey i can't take their new faith i'm out of here yeah uh a, a brother sister's not in bondage so you don't have to go chasing them or force them back into the marriage you're not under bondage in such cases yeah. all right and that should stand for anybody being abused too i i I can't, I'm sick of it, of pastors telling these women that as long as one of them is trying, that the marriage will work. Yep. And they're being abused. I had one lady that had her husband shuck a, lo- a loaded shotgun to her head in front of her children, pulled the trigger, and it jammed. And the pastor is telling her that still it's it's her fault. And, I, and I'm sick in my stomach over it because of this whole if you divorce for anything other, even though he was an adulterer, divorce anything other than adultery, you're committing sin. It's just, it's horrific. Uh, but it says, for what knowest thou a wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? So he's saying, you know, if you hang in there and don't leave because you're a believer and they're not, how do you know God's not going to use you? To get them saved. You know, you can show them Christ's love as, as their spouse and tell them about Jesus. You don't know. He might use you to get them saved also. So um, that's all he's saying. That they can be witnesses to, to get their husband or wife saved through the gospel. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't have anything to add to that. So l- let's take a, a couple of minutes now to first let's see if there's anything in the chat room that needs a response. Uh, are you guys aware of anything in the chat room you need to respond to? There is something nice. It's that Kendrick girl, KK. She wrote, uh, I am so happy to be part of this. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Thank you. And we're happy that you're with us. And uh, this congregation is a blessing to all of us and and to so many. Um, I'll tell you this, Brother Luke, sorry to interrupt, but I'll I'll tell you this about the chat. that They certainly have been uh, talking about what we're uh, discussing here tonight. Um, it, it, it's gotten better and better and better in my opinion in the chat. And, um, uh, we're just blessed to have these, uh, particular people that come in the, in the chat room and, and, uh, you know, stay on topic and they, they do fellowship with each other and stuff. But they just, um, you know, they listen and, uh, make good comments and it's just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is, it is wonderful. And it's something we've, we've said many times, please. Uh, in the chat room, um, can you listen and and participate uh, on the and stay on the same page and verses that we're on? And uh, uh, it'll be better for everybody instead of going off onto other subjects and tangents and stuff. And we also, I didn't notice anybody coming in here tonight to, to cause trouble. So without any troublemakers, I think to sidetrack people, it's probably going to be much easier for people to just focus on the actual scriptures. Yeah. So, um, uh, Renee, uh, what are your, uh, your closing remarks? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's clear this is practical advice to already save people. It's so unfortunate that these verses about um, encouragement uh, and exhorting already saved saints to proper behavior are used out of context to show that you've got to do these behaviors or be faithful to these behaviors to get or keep salvation that's where i've got a problem with i mean it's crazy they all think we love sin and we promote sin we we believe everything you got to be born again first and if you don't believe the gospel first then all of this instruction doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you follow it or not you know first things first so um i think he made it real clear here though that fornication joining your body sexually with another person's body outside of the bond of marriage is a great sin against your own body and probably the body of Christ itself. It's not an, uh, it's not a sin done outside the body, outside of our, our body or outside the body of Christ. I think it's, he let it be known that, that joining your body together with another, uh, a harlot, it says, you know, and I do think that has to do with the temple prostitution being done in Corinth at that time great fertility goddesses being worshipped uh, all over uh, Asia Minor back then. So I think that's the reference to fornication there. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a question. um, uh, What if an unbelieving spouse leaves and then wants to come back? Do we have to take them back? 
Well, I think that we learned from the scriptures that uh, we, we should just let them go and you're free. Uh, and I would say that if you've moved on with your life, you, let's say you're, you get divorced and you're remarried or, or let's just say that your life has moved on, that you're no longer under an obligation. You're free according to what we just studied. But should you uh, consider letting them back? That, that's probably an individual case that we should, each person has to consider. Anything on that before we say goodnight? Uh, I agree. I agree with what you just said. Nothing else to add. Okay. Uh, all right, then. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday, so we also have the, the Fellowship Friday. I invite everybody to join us at uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time for that. Uh, Sister Renee, uh, did you say that you're – program tomorrow night is on or not uh, it will be now that i've got this charger unless my pit bull puppy decides to eat this one too and keep it huh. in the drawer huh. i'm hoping that we can protect it for the night but i planned on having the thursday theological showdown a throwdown tomorrow night Part thursday two. theological throwdown that's, right. that's what i need i need that voice yeah. promoting it uh, do it. yeah that'd be so awesome do hey, uh, need, Mariah, see if you can record his voice saying that and we'll play it at the beginning every yeah. show. Well, right. uh, okay, uh, so join Renee tomorrow night for her program. Uh, 930. 930 Eastern Time. We're going over uh, Marian Apparitions Part 2 of the Apparitions and why they're satanic. Okay. Do you have somebody joining you? Uh, Brother Dave's going to join me for the second half of it tomorrow night. Okay. Uh, all right, then. Let's just give Brother uh, Matthias a, a chance. If, like to, if Matthias would like to say goodnight or say make any comments on the time tonight, uh, go ahead, Brother. No, I'm just sitting here in the background enjoying it. Uh, I, I actually get edified and learn things as we roll, roll through these different versions together. But... Uh, but yes, that was funny. You guys picked up real quick uh, the <laughs> false works based gospel of uh, deciding to follow Jesus, mm. which we uh, which we are strongly against on TD. Yes, did I classify it correctly, Matthias? Oh yes, sir. Thank yes, you, you did. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I mean, that should tell everybody that. Uh, we read the KJV first, that's the scriptures that we trust. Uh, and, and we look at the others because sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes when we test it against what we know uh, to be true, it, it, it misses the mark. And so we can, we're able to identify when they are wrong. Okay, thank you everybody. And I look forward to next time. Bless you all in the name of our great savior God, Jesus.